prescription drug coverage and other medical services in one complete package, often for no more than what you currently pay for original Medicare. No wonder it's called Medicare Complete. Call Secure Horizons today and learn how you can get more complete coverage without paying more and without having to get a Medicare supplement. It's a health care plan that not only helps take care of you when something goes wrong, but helps you stay healthy in the first place. Enjoy benefits like an annual preventive screening and immunizations for no additional cost, vision and hearing benefits, and more. And some plans have zero monthly premiums. In these changing times, the name on your Medicare plan may be more important than ever. As one of the leaders in Medicare plans, Secure Horizons knows how to get more from Medicare benefits. With the cost of many things still going up, AARP Medicare Complete from Secure Horizons is a smart choice in uncertain times. Is your health care missing something? Get the whole picture and you'll see. Everything's better when it's complete. Annual enrollment starts November 15th. Even if you're already enrolled in another Medicare Advantage plan, call now to get the complete package with AARP Medicare Complete from Secure Horizons. And don't pay more, just get more. You don't have to be an AARP member to enroll. So call Secure Horizons today or visit getcomplete.com. Next time on an all-new Barbecue Pitmasters. Whole hog to me is the ultimate challenge in barbecue. I'm going head-to-head -head against Myron. I am the best hog cooker out here. I think he'll be very surprised at how well I'm going to do. She'll make finals, but she won't beat me. With two competitions and two sets of rules, tensions are running high. I am a nervous wreck. But when tempers flare, things really start to heat up. Get your damn hand off. All right. An all-new Barbecue Pitmasters. Let the flames begin. Tomorrow at 10, only on TLC. Attention, all Medicare beneficiaries who need assistance getting around their homes. There is a Medicare benefit that may qualify you for a new power chair or scooter at little to no cost to you. Imagine one scooter or power chair that could improve your mobility and your life. One Medicare benefit that, with private insurance, may entitle you to pay little to nothing to own it. One company that can make it all happen. Your power chair will be paid in full. The Scooter Store. Hi, I'm Dan Weston. We're experts at getting you the scooter or power chair you need. In fact, if we pre-qualify you for Medicare reimbursement and Medicare denies your claim, we'll give you your new power chair or scooter free. I didn't pay a penny out of pocket for my power chair. With help from the scooter store, Medicare and my insurance covered it all. Call the scooter store for free information today. Call 1-800-587-4613 for free information. That number again is 1-800-587-4613. Tomorrow, on an all-new Science of the Movies, go behind the scenes at Premier Special Effects Shop, Industrial Light and Magic. Davy Jones. Where we reveal how Jack Sparrow battled the storm of the century. These simulations have to look very real because we want the person to sit down in the theater and go, wow! Then, before you can say camera action, you need lights. It really is a means of creating a mood and telling the story. Science of the Movies, all new, tomorrow at 8, only on Science Channel. In April 1998, Japan's Akashi Kaikyo Bridge was officially open to traffic. An unlikely dream first proposed 84 years earlier is now a reality. The bridge authority predicts around 30,000 vehicles will cross the structure each day, despite the $20 toll. Local governments hope it will revitalize the region's economy by attracting
Good morning. The Subcommittee on Government Management Organization and Procurement of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will now come to order. Today's hearing will focus on the federal government's role and responsibility in the global protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights. The subcommittee will also seek additional information from administrative witnesses on the strategic objectives of the Obama administration for improving coordination among the stakeholder agencies having IPR protection or enforcement responsibilities. Okay. Uh, without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. I'd like to welcome all of you to today's subcommittee hearing on federal efforts to protect and enforce the intellectual property rights of our nation's industrial base throughout the domestic and global marketplace. Before we begin, I'd like to apologize for the subcommittee having to postpone our original hearing that was scheduled for November 4th, but our legislative calendar was rather full that week, as some of you probably will recall. So I welcome our distinguished witnesses, especially those who have had to rearrange their travel or business schedules in order to attend today's uh, rescheduled hearing and look forward to hearing your testimony. Intellectual property rights, or IPR, is an issue that is near and dear to my heart and the livelihood of many of my constituents. My congressional district, the 33rd, which includes Los Angeles, Culver City, and Hollywood, California, is home to a number of important entertainment companies, including Sony Studios, the Culver uh, Studios, Capitol Records, uh, Raleigh Studios, and television studios, and of course the American Film Institute. According to figures compiled by Americans for the Arts, approximately 30,000 people are employed in entertainment-related industries located in my congressional district. More than 18,000 people who work in the congressional district make a living from film radio and television, whose profits and future viability are dependent on strong IPR protection and enforcement. As a fellow member of the California Congressional Delegation, I know my ranking member, uh, Bill Bray, recognizes the vital economic importance of intellectual property to our state's economic health, as well as to the future growth and stability of our nation and the global economy. Since the establishment of the World Trade Organization in 1995, America's key IP-related industries have prospered through our uh, domestic uh, comparative advantage in innovation and research. But this advantage has been severely undermined by sharp escalation in IP infringement, such as piracy and counterfeiting. Even among our closest and most vital trading partners and strategic allies. This causes great economic harm to innovations and innovators who invest significant capital in the products or creations that have improved our standard of living and increased our knowledge base. While the true amount is unclear, recent estimates 
of the losses or costs associated with IP infringement for the U.S. domestic industry ranges from 200 to $250 billion annually. The prevalence of such losses extends to all IP-related sectors, including information technology, life sciences, digital content, pharmaceuticals, the defense industry, and the entertainment industry. These losses threaten our nation's economic growth and global leadership in innovation. Furthermore, IPR infringement poses significant risk to our national security, consumer welfare, and ability to rely upon an effective legal framework for our domestic industries working abroad. According to the Los Angeles County Economic Development Cooperation, the cost of global privacy and counterfeiting activities in Los Angeles County in the year 2005 was estimated at $5.2 billion. Those figures were proportionally shared across all sectors of the IP-driven economy with motion pictures leading the way at $2.7 billion, followed by the recording industry, apparel members, apparel makers, and software developers. Unless such trends are soon curtailed, the roughly 1 million LA County IP dependent jobs will be placed at a significant risk. The findings in this year's special 301 report issued by the Office of U.S. Trade Representatives tell us that a combination of technological advances and various market access barriers in key countries are preventing our companies from protecting their IP-based goods and services. So with that in mind, I would like our witnesses to discuss what they believe are the major factors in the escalation of IPR infringement abroad. Specifically, I want our government uh, panelists to explain how they believe the newly established intellectual property enforcement excuse me, Enforcement Coordination Office will aid in their development of a stronger framework for managing our interagency IPR protection and enforcement responsibilities, both domestically and abroad. Specifically, with new authorities, and what new authorities has this office been granted to police our patchwork of agencies charged with combating global IPR infringement. Furthermore, I'd like you to discuss how our trade agreements with other nations, including those issues being negotiated as part of the proposed anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, are reducing the growing incident of digital-based privacy or the illegal manufacturing of counterfeit drugs and consumer goods for importation. These activities pose significant threats to our economy, to public health, to national security, and must be countered in order to maintain our position in the global marketplace. And lastly, I'd like to address an emergency, an emerging IPR issue with the People's Republic of China and its efforts to restrict our domestic technology industries from participating in their government-wide procurement programs. And under the Chinese government's newly issued rules, only products that contain Chinese proprietary intellectual property would be eligible for government procurement. 
This process will, in effect, result in excluding the products of international companies from the government procurement market in China. This is a troubling development that will have major economic consequences for our trade relations if we do not find an amicable resolution. And I am hopeful that our witnesses can educate us on the latest developments with these matters and other uh, recommendations on how we at the subcommittee can be helpful in facilitating a resolution for all parties involved. I'll also ask my ranking member, Mr. Bill Bray, for his consideration on how we may be able to work collaboratively on this topic of vital importance to our home state's economy. Once again, I want to thank our panelists for joining us today and look forward to your testimony. And with that, uh, are you taking the place, Mr. Issa? Yeah, our distinguished member, Mr. Issa from San Diego, will take the place of our ranking member, Mr. Bilberry. Thank you, Madam Mr. Chair. Issa. And I would I'd ask unanimous consent that uh, Mr. Bilberry's entire opening uh, statement be placed in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. Intellectual property contributes $5.5 trillion, I repeat, $5.5 trillion a year to our economy. In fact, we have become the intellectual property giant around the world. We have traded many, many jobs, entry-level jobs in manufacturing of garments and other products for our development of these high-skill, high-paying jobs, and we've offloaded many of them to China. So I find it today particularly uh, confusing that China would look at this bargain that has been so favorable to them and begin the process of far exceeding any, any moratorium or prohibition allowed under the WTO. We in the United States Congress, under the chairwoman in my watch, participated in China ascending to the WTO. They did so not having met all the requirements, but with a promise to meet them and to continue in this direction. Intellectual property was, in fact, at the core of the items which China had not lived up to their responsibility but promised to. Over the years, countries such as Russia have been prohibited and stopped from getting into that for a good reason. We've seen that China has not gained any respect for intellectual property. In fact, they continue to be the largest customer uh, in Asia for Microsoft products. They simply don't buy them. Madam Chair, it's very clear that we have to say that China has a right to have such special property as is necessary for its own defense. We, too, maintain a policy that certain Technology must be domestic for our national security. Certainly neither one of us would want uh, the ability to put a, uh, a, uh, a space-based defense system into space not to be domestic uh, and domestically controllable and known. But China very clearly is trying to force partnering with U.S. companies, transfer of technology for purposes of getting a jump start on that next generation of products and services. So, Madam Chair, I appreciate your viewing something which this committee has a long-standing belief that we not only control the procurement process government-wide, but we have, an, by necessity, a requirement to look beyond our borders for free and fair trade and access for our products. So I look forward to our witnesses, and again, Madam Chair, thank you for holding this important uh, hearing, and I yield back. Thank you. Without objection, uh, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. I now yield to uh, Congressman Coyar for opening statement. Thank you. thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate this hearing. I, uh, I'm a big believer in the... Uh, and trade agreements, but one of the things that I think, along with my other colleagues, we got to make sure that we protect our intellectual properties. I'm interested as we go through the testimony to see what um, 
what we're looking at as we look at uh, the countries of Colombia, the countries of uh, Panama, and of course uh, Korea also, if y'all could highlight that also during your testimony, if one of y'all can do that. Otherwise, uh, Madam Chair, I'm ready to uh, listen to the testimony and ask some questions afterwards. Thank you very much for having us here today. If there are no further opening statements, uh, the subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. And um, we'll now turn to our first panel. There'll be two uh, this morning. And it's the policy uh, of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. And I'd like to ask uh, all of you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And I will now introduce the panelists. And we'll first start with Mr. Stanford K. McCoy, who is the Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for the Intellectual Property and Innovation at the Office of U.S. Trade Representative. And he serves as the Chief Policy Advisor to the United States uh, Trade Representative on the Intellectual Property and Trade Issues and serves as the lead U.S. Trade Negotiator on Intellectual Property and Innovation to the WTO and TRIPS Council and as part of the U.S. Free Trade Agreement negotiations. Next to him is Mr. Robert Stoll, who is the Commissioner of Patents at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, where he oversees the administration of all USPTO patent programs. And prior to his current appointment, uh, Mr. Stoll served as Director of Enforcement for USPTO, as well as Dean of Education and Training Programs for external agency stakeholders involved with intellectual property issues. Mr. Jason Weinstein is the Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Criminal Division at the U.S. Department of Justice. Before joining the Criminal Division, Mr. Weinstein served as Chief of the Violent Crime section in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Maryland and as Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Before becoming a federal prosecutor, Mr. Weinstein served as Special Investigative Counsel in the Justice Department's Office of Inspector General. Mr. William Kraft is the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Economics, Energy, and Business Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Prior to this, he was Director of the Office of Multilateral Trade and Agricultural Affairs. He is the lead officer in the State Department for all issues related to the World Trade Organization, or WTO, including negotiations involving the Doha Development Round and WTO uh, accession issues. And Mr. Lauren Yeager is the Director of International Affairs and Trade at the Government Accountability Office, where he oversees issues associated with intellectual property rights and international trade uh, negotiations. And I ask that each of the witnesses uh, now give a brief summary of their testimony and to keep this summary under five minutes in duration. Your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. And before we proceed, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Chu if she would like to make an opening statement. I'm just uh, happy to take part in these proceedings and I look forward to hearing what the witnesses have to say. We're happy to have you. Oh, Mr. Uh, McCoy, would you please proceed? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. 
Thank you to the ranking member, Mr. Bill Bray, and uh, all the members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to join you today and talk a little bit about the mission of the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative in respect of the protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights. As you said in your opening statement, Madam Chairwoman, one of the factors that makes American exporters and investors competitive across so many sectors of the global economy is the value we add to our products and services through innovation and creativity. Intellectual property rights and their protection and enforcement are critical to securing that comparative advantage in global trade and thus to securing the jobs of workers in America's many innovative and creative industries. Providing leadership in the creation and maintenance of a global infrastructure of trade rules to support American exports and investments is a critical part of the work of the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. It's a job that we carry out in coordination with the other agencies represented here at the table and in coordination in coming days with the new intellectual property enforcement coordinator who's recently been confirmed by the Senate. We carry out that mission in many ways. One of the best tools we have is one that was handed to us by the United States Congress of consistently monitoring our partners' trade practices through the Special 301 report. If they know that we are holding a magnifying glass up to their actions, they will be less likely to break the rules. And Special 301 is one of our biggest and strongest magnifying glasses. We use it to scour the globe for copycats and counterfeiters and call out countries that provide safe havens for the theft of American intellectual property. Madam Chairwoman, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the first Special 301 report, which was mandated by the U.S. Congress in 1988 and first issued in 1989. The past two decades have brought enormous new challenges in the scope and sophistication of international piracy and counterfeiting. The Special 301 process has expanded in scope and breadth to match that challenge. For our most recent report, USTR examined IPR protection and enforcement in 77 countries and listed 46 of them in the report. Special 301 works because the report's rankings shine a light on IP protection and enforcement and also afford an opportunity to give credit where it's due. The Republic of Korea is a good example of both of those. It was removed from the watch list in 2000. Nine, marking the latest in a series of improvements in the Asia Pacific region and around the world that have been encouraged and recognized through the Special 301 process created by Congress. We hope to see that trend continue and spread. It is vital that trading partners such as China, Russia, and other countries on the priority watch list and watch list follow suit. It is also critical that valued trading partners like Canada and Spain step up and confront emerging challenges like internet piracy. China still presents significant challenges to the protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights, including the indigenous innovation challenge that was mentioned by you, Madam Chairwoman, and by Mr. Issa in your opening statements. With China, we are making use of every available trade tool to achieve progress on IP issues. Madam Chairwoman, let me say it as plainly as Ambassador Kirk has said it, China must do more to protect U.S. intellectual property rights. In addition to reporting and engaging bilaterally, USTR is also providing essential leadership through trade agreements to strengthen norms for the enforcement of intellectual property rights. A key USTR initiative in this area is the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, or ACTA. In that effort, we're partnering with a group of key trading partners representing about 50% of global, global merchand merchandise trade. When it's finalized, the ACTA will help governments around the world to more effectively combat the proliferation of pirated and counterfeit goods. With that, Madam Chairwoman, I will close my summary of my remarks and thank you and the members of the committee again for the opportunity to be here today. I thank you, Mr. McCoy, and Mr. Stoll, you may proceed. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman Watson and members of the subcommittee. I am pleased 
to be here to discuss the efforts of the Department of Commerce and the USPTO in promoting the protection of intellectual property rights in a global economy. Innovation and creativity are essential ingredients of our nation's prosperity. Appropriate protection of that innovation and creativity, domestically and internationally, is necessary to stimulate job growth and promote our economic well-being. That's why safeguarding these important assets is a top priority for all of us at this table and throughout the Obama administration. It is truly a team effort among our agencies to help fight piracy and counterfeiting within and outside our borders. The Department of Commerce plays an important role in encouraging innovation and strengthening the nation's ability to compete in the global marketplace. The USPTO's statute directs us to advise the President through the Secretary of Commerce on intellectual property issues and to advise other federal departments and agencies on matters of intellectual property policy in the United States and in intellectual property protection in other countries. To this end, we are actively involved with the development of overall U.S. government IP policy. We work to develop unified standards for international IP, provide policy guidance on domestic IP issues, and work with other agencies to secure strong IP provisions in free trade and other international agreements. We also provide training, education, and capacity building programs designed to foster respect for IP and encourage the development of strong IP enforcement regimes by U.S. trading partners. Madam Chair, my written statement contains more details of a wide range of our efforts. In my limited time here, I'd like to highlight some of our programs and initiatives. The USPTO coordinates, organizes, and participates in intellectual property rights training, trade capacity building, and technical assistance. We are especially proud of our Global Intellectual Property Academy, or GIPA. Since its creation in 2005, the USPTO has provided in its, its 20,000 square foot training facility in Alexandria, Virginia, a high level capacity building programs and technical assistance training to foreign judges, prosecutors, customs officials, IP enforcement personnel, as well as officials from copyright, trademark, and patent offices from around the world. Those individuals come to the U.S. to learn, discuss, and strategize about global intellectual property rights protection and enforcement. Our program goals include fostering a better understanding of international intellectual property obligations and norms, exposing participants to the U.S. model of protecting and enforcing intellectual property rights, and promoting discussion of intellectual property issues in a friendly and supportive environment. The Academy provides both multilateral programs and country-specific programs as needed. We further envision programs dedicated to specific legal issues or technologies as the Academy continues to develop. The USPTO's pro programs reached an average of 4,000 individuals in over 100 countries annually. In partnership with the Department of Commerce's U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service and the Department of State, USPTO intellectual property experts are sent out to strengthen global intellectual property protection and enforcement overseas in selected high-profile countries where U.S. IP challenges are greatest. The IP experts support as part of the Overseas Intellectual Rights, Rights Attaché Program, U.S. embassies and consulates on IPR issues, including devising strategies to stop counterfeiting and piracy, and supporting U.S. government efforts to improve the protection and enforcement of IPR. They also advocate U.S. intellectual property policies, coordinate training on IPR matters, and assist U.S. businesses that rely on IPR protection abroad. The USPTO has offered free programs and materials to help small and medium-sized businesses improve their understanding of intellectual property, increase the value of intellectual property in their businesses to protect against counterfeiting and piracies, and of their intellectual property through our public awareness campaign. An important effort is the Intellectual Property Awareness Campaign, IPAC, IP Basics program offered nationwide by USPTO since 2005 to over 1,000 small and medium-sized businesses. These programs included 
presentations by our attorney advisors that cover the entire range of intellectual property. And with that, Madam Chairman, I would like to conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stoll. Mr. Weinberg, you may proceed. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank you, Chairman Watson, and the ranking member, and the members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to appear before you today. Attorney General Holder has made intellectual property protection a top priority, and the Department of Justice is fully committed to aggressive, effective criminal enforcement efforts to protect our nation's IP stakeholders and the American public. The Department has worked with our law enforcement partners to develop a strong enforcement program that combines aggressive uh, investigation and prosecution of IP crimes with law enforcement training and victim outreach. However, because we understand that in the global economy, a successful criminal enforcement program requires a strong international component, we also work in partnership with our foreign law enforcement counterparts whenever possible, which has resulted in great successes. For example, in January of this year, Kevin Zhu was sentenced to 78 months in prison for conspiring with others in China to traffic in counterfeit cancer drugs and other pharmaceuticals. Many of these counterfeits were lacking active ingredients or contained uh, unidentified impurities, and drugs with lot numbers identical to the counterfeits were detected in the legitimate supply chain in London, which prompted a massive recall in the UK. Just this past September, the department obtained its 64th felony conviction arising from Operation Fastlink, which targeted multinational organized criminal networks. In the underlying investigation, which was one of the largest international law enforcement actions ever taken against online piracy, the FBI worked with foreign law enforcement to conduct over 120 simultaneous search warrants in 27 states and a dozen foreign countries. Now, these are just two examples of the many, many successful international enforcement efforts that we have participated in, and we're proud of all of them. And they all demonstrate the value of strong relationships with international uh, and foreign law enforcement. The cornerstone of the department's uh, international efforts is the Intellectual Property Law Enforcement Coordinator, or IPLEC, program. With the help of the State Department, we have deployed two experienced federal prosecutors to serve as IPLEX, one in Southeast Asia and one in Eastern Europe, to provide training and operational assistance in those regions. Working with the IPLEC for Asia, the Department also spearheaded the formation of the Intellectual Property Crimes Enforcement Network, or IPSEN, which has helped to strengthen communication channels and promote the informal exchange of evidence among member nations in Asia. In addition, the Department, through the Criminal Division, co-chairs the Intellectual Property Criminal Enforcement Working Group, which is part of the U.S.-China Joint Liaison Group for Law Enforcement Cooperation. The Working Group has fostered an open dialogue on criminal IP enforcement, has increased information and evidence sharing, and has resulted in a number of successful joint operations between the U.S. and China, including Operation Summer Solstice, which targeted a criminal organization believed to be responsible for the distribution of over $2 billion worth of pirated and counterfeit software. Summer Solstice was the largest ever joint criminal enforcement operation between the FBI and law enforcement in China. More generally, the department has placed great emphasis on efforts to strengthen enforcement capacity overseas, from Europe to Asia to Africa to South America to Mexico. In fact, over the past five years, working in partnership with some of the agencies represented here on this panel with me, DOJ attorneys have provided training and education on IP enforcement to over 10,000 prosecutors, investigators, and judicial officers from over 100 countries. And because IP crime has increasingly become the province of international organized crime, we're working to identify and to address links between organized crime and intellectual property. And the department has already taken a number of significant steps to incorporate IP into its existing international organized crime strategy as directed by the Pro-IP Act. To succeed in, in the missions that I've outlined, we work closely with all of our partner law enforcement agencies, uh, including through the National Intellectual Property Rights Coordination Center. And our ability to increase the number and scope of our IP investigations has also been bolstered more recently by the addition of 31 dedicated FBI special agents to investigating IP crime, and we appreciate Congress's decision to fund those positions. Finally, the Department works extensively on IP issues with other agencies in the federal government, including those represented here today and with the industries most affected by IP crime. And we also look forward to working closely with Victoria Espinel, who was confirmed just last week as the new IP enforcement coordinator, and with our partner agencies on uh, the newly formed or to be formed IPEC advisory committee. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to share with you the high priority that the Attorney General places on criminal enforcement of IP rights and the work that we do every day at the Department of Justice to combat intellectual property crime both here and abroad, and I'd be happy to take your questions. 
Einstein, and now you may proceed, Mr. Kraft. Uh, thank you, Chairman Watson, <coughs> Honorable Committee Members. It is a pleasure to be here today to, set, to testify on the State Department's role in protecting intellectual property rights in today's global economy. We welcome the Committee's interest in this issue and look forward to continuing to Can you bring your mic a little closer? Sorry, ma'am. I'm, yeah. I'm suffering from a cold a little bit, I'm afraid. Uh, we welcome the Committee's interest in this issue and look forward to continuing to work with you to achieve our mutual goal of ensuring that U.S. intellectual property rights are fully respected everywhere in the world. As President Obama has said, innovation is the key to good new jobs for the 21st century. Since intellectual property rights encourage and reward innovation, protecting American intellectual property abroad is one of the State Department's top economic policy priorities. We, we work closely with other U.S. government agencies, the private sector, and foreign governments to achieve that goal. Within the State Department, our efforts are led by the Office of Intellectual Property Enforcement, part of the trade policy and programs deputate that I head. That office now has a staff of 12 people. As you are aware, Congress created this office in 2005 to strengthen State Department efforts to combat counterfeiting and piracy. IPE promotes enforcement of U.S. IP rights overseas, represents the State Department in interagency IPR policy discussions, and participates actively in bilateral and multilateral negotiations to improve enforcement of IP rights. State implements IPR enforcement training and technical assistance programs, for which the Congress has given us $4 million in 2009. In calendar year 2009, we used that money to train over 1,500 customs, police, and judicial officials from more than 21 countries, including Ukraine, Mexico, Russia, Vietnam, and Nigeria. State also conducts public outreach to foreign audiences on the importance of IP to host country economies, innovators, and creators, and trains our embassy officers overseas around the world on IP enforcement. Intellectual property enforcement is integrated into the work of other State Department bureaus and offices. For example, we work closely with our Bureau of International Organizations and with other agencies to strengthen the World Intellectual Property Organization and to ensure that other UN agencies support good IP policy. Our regional bureaus, U.S. embassies and consulates are on the front lines of protecting U.S. IP rights in particular countries, responding to complaints raised by U.S. companies and vigorously pressing foreign governments to combat piracy and counterfeiting. There is a foreign service officer assigned to work on intellectual property protection in every U.S. embassy overseas. Madam Chairwoman, as you've noted, piracy and counterfeiting are still enormous problems, but we are making some headway. Uh, there are more examples in my written testimony, but let me just cite two examples of areas where we think we've made a concrete impact. On the enforcement side, the U.S. government and the private sector have been working actively with Mexico to encourage them to increase enforcement of their laws. And working on information uh, provided by the uh, U.S. industry, the Mexican Attorney General's office recently arrested a number of individuals for camcording in movie theaters, thereby dismantling one of Mexico's major camcording rings. In terms of the winning hearts and minds side on public outreach, we think an excellent example is the way that our embassy in Bosnia helped to develop an IPR school campaign with a curriculum and comic books printed in the three local languages, supported by appearances by the U.S. ambassador and several Bosnian movie and mu music stars. Let me just note, uh, Madam Chairwoman, that uh, the State Department concurs with the recent GAO report's recommendations on improving coordination between uh, our embassies and our intellectual property attaches overseas, and we have sent a cable to relevant posts instructing them to implement the recommendations of the, of the GAO. Uh, we are getting responses from the post and we're reviewing those now. As Mr. Stoll and some of the others have noted, uh, we know uh, very well and very favorably uh, Ms. Espinel and we look forward to working with her as she tries to raise the uh, uh, image and uh, profile of protecting intellectual property as she takes on her new role uh, and we look forward to working very closely with her. So finally, let me just, just thank you and the committee for your interest in this very important issue and to assure you that we look forward to working with you to strengthen our efforts to protect intellectual property. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kraft, and now you may proceed, Mr. Yeager. Thank you. Good, good morning, Madam Chairwoman, Ranking Member Bill Bray, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee to discuss our work on U.S. efforts to protect intellectual property rights. We appreciate the opportunity to continue our contributions to the record that this committee has established on IP protection. 
This hearing is timely as Congress recently overhauled the U.S. structure for IP protection. The Pro-IP Act created a new structure and the Senate recently confirmed the coordinator to chair the new advisory committee. In my statement today, I will address two topics on IP protection and enforcement that are relevant to that new structure. First, let me talk about the lessons learned from past efforts to coordinate IP protection and enforcement. And second, I'll make a few observations on the efforts of the Patent and Trademark Office intellectual property attaches in key countries around the world. Let me start with a few observations from our prior work. The Pro-IP Act of 2008 enacted several changes that address weaknesses we found in the prior IP coordinating structure. That structure was initiated under two different authorities and lacked clear leadership and permanence, hampering the effectiveness and long-term viability of such coordination. In a GAO report undertaken for this committee in 2004, we reported that this council had not undertaken any independent activities since it was created. Congress subsequently made enhancements in 2004 to strengthen its role, but we reported that it continued to have leadership challenges. In contrast, the presidential initiative called STOP had a positive image among the agencies and the private sector, and from its beginning was characterized by a high level of coordination and visibility. However, as a presidential initiative, it lacked permanence since its influence was tied to a single administration. While its impact will depend upon its implementation, the Pro-IP Act of 2008 enacted several changes that address weaknesses in that prior structure. For example, the Act places leadership in the Executive Office of the President, a status similar to STOP. In addition, the Pro-IP Act specifically requires the new agency to prepare a strategic plan that builds in mechanisms for accountability and for oversight. The Pro-IP Act requires the Council to submit the strategic plan to committees of the Congress to improve accountability. Let me now turn to another important issue, and that is the placement of PTO IP attaches abroad. An additional theme of the Pro-IP Act is the emphasis on strengthening the capacity of U.S. agencies abroad to protect and enforce IP rights. In a report we released in September of this year, we found that the IP attaches could be an asset to U.S. firms and to other U.S. agencies who needed assistance in matters related to IP enforcement. These IP attaches provided this assistance by adopting a number of practices. First, the attaches served as effective focal points. Prior to the creation of the IP attache position, state economic officers had primary responsibility for IP. But IP attaches are full-time on the issue, and they also impart their subject matter expertise, which enhances their effectiveness as focal points. Second, they established IP working groups. Several agency officials at the posts we visited in China, Thailand, and India said that the working groups provided several benefits, such as increasing coordination on training and on other activities. And third, the attaches leverage resources through joint activities. For example, the IP attaches help the foreign and commercial service efforts to assist firms by providing advice on how to avoid IP problems and answering IP-related questions. While our observations on PTOs, attaches abroad are largely positive, our prior work has also demonstrated that the long-term success of overseas operations requires careful attention to human capital planning. In particular, we've observed that other agencies attempting to establish a presence abroad had to make specific efforts to ensure that they could recruit and retain sufficient personnel with both the technical as well as the cultural expertise that is essential in those posts. These considerations may be important as the Congress and the PTO make decisions about the scale and the permanence of this program. Madam Chairwoman, Ranking Member Bill Bray, Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee to summarize our work. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you or other members have. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yeager. And uh, we'll now move to our question uh, period and proceed under the five-minute rule. And before that, I'd like to welcome Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney to our committee. Thank you for coming and sitting in with us today. Um, I want to delve a little deeper into what is happening, Mr. McCoy, uh, and particularly this week in China. And uh, we know that uh, the government is developing regulations regarding uh, what 
are being called, uh, as you mentioned, a national uh, indigenous innovative or innovation products. And my understanding at these regulations would in essence create preferences for Chinese vendors and eliminate US information technology and intercommunication industries from China's government procurement and acquisition markets. And this proposal obviously raises multiple issues surrounding compliance with international trade laws as well as our bilateral agreements with the Chinese government. So can you address uh, how the Obama administration, including the USTR, uh, has been uh, proactive uh, with this issue? It's very troubling to us, so let us know. Madam Chairwoman, this is indeed a serious concern that you've identified, this uh, indigenous innovation preference issue. Uh, certainly it's in the interest of both the U.S. government and the Chinese government to promote innovation. There are appropriate ways to do that, and there are inappropriate ways to do that. Let's be clear, innovation is no excuse for discrimination. We are very alert to these industry concerns about China's indigenous innovation policies in a wide range of areas, including the recent announcements out of China on a uh, procurement preference list. Uh, we are in the process of expressing our serious concerns. The interagency team in the U.S. government has sprung into action. Uh, Ambassador Huntsman uh, has received instructions, and he and his team are in the process of raising our questions with all of the appropriate counterparts in the Chinese government. And I can assure you we will stay fully engaged and continue to follow this closely. Uh, there has been mention that uh, we have attaches and... Uh we have FBI and so on in our overseas uh, embassies. And um, so I'm really pleased to hear that uh, you're working through the ambassadors. I've been there and uh, we really need to uh, have close scrutiny and uh, interchange back with the administration as to how we're progressing. Okay, um, the 2009 Special 301 report that was mentioned highlighted the increased incidence of internet privacy among US trading partners. Some countries such as France and Britain have uh, pursued legislation that would cut off internet access for users who repeatedly are caught engaging in integral peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file sharing. And any of you that would like to address this particular question, please feel free to do so. Do you believe that this is a potential uh, legislative remedy to our own significant peer-to-peer -peer file sharing problem? We'll start with you, Mr. Stoll. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Madam Chairman. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, there is that, that that type of uh, activity would be uh, something that the United States would want to follow. Uh, I, I think that there is a, an intent uh, to, uh, to try to take care of the issues related to piracy in, in many manners, but I'm not sure that uh, removing access, I think it was a, in France it's a three strikes you're out program. Uh, I'm not sure that that would be palatable here in the United States. Uh, I think that um, taking many other actions to be able to reduce piracy in the United States is an important uh, interest in all of the agencies represented here, but I'm not sure that's the right direction to go in. Mr. Weinstein. Uh, I would agree with that, um, Madam Chairwoman. As a general matter, um, it's, it's my view that the technology is not the problem, it's the way in which the technology is being used that creates the problem, and I think this is no exception. Um, in terms of criminal enforcement, we are increasingly concerned, we have been for some time, and we are continuing to be concerned about online piracy. It is perhaps the greatest emphasis of our computer crime and IP section, and in pursuing online piracy, we work closely with industry, with the Motion Picture Association of America, with the uh, Business Software Alliance, with the uh, Entertainment Software Association, to help uh, identify emerging trends and to identify 
and prosecute the most serious online copyright thieves. We've had great successes over the last few years and are continuing to prosecuting wares groups, that is online organized groups that are engaging in piracy of software and music, um, focusing on the first suppliers, on the primary distributors of those materials online. Um, we have more recently engaged in fairly aggressive uh, investigative operations against peer-to-peer -peer networks, particularly those using BitTorrent software. Um, we had a, an operation that we called D-Elite, which resulted in eight convictions, including uh, the, the uh, uh, first ever conviction at trial of a high-ranking administrator of a P2P website that was distributing massive amounts of in, infringing uh, copyrighted works, um, software, video games, music, uh, movies, the whole, the whole works, um, and who got a substantial sentence. Um, we're also trying to get the problem at the, at the source. Oftentimes, the, the multi-million dollar online piracy scheme begins with a camcorder someone who's taping a movie, for example, uh, in a movie theater. And, and so we have aggressively worked in partnership with the MPAA um, uh, and other interested partners, uh, interested partners to identify um, appropriate targets for camcording cases and, and um, recently convicted, uh, late last year convicted, uh, a gentleman named Michael Logan here in D.C. who um, was viewed as perhaps the most prolific camcorder on the East Coast. Um, so we're trying to get to the problem at, at all ends, um, both once they're on an, uh, an infringing site uh, and, and even at the origin when, at the camcording uh, level. I would also say that since this problem is increasingly an international one, our international work um, engagement with foreign partners is increasingly important in this area, perhaps more than any other. And the IPLEC program that I mentioned um, is a key component to that strategy. Um, the fact that uh, these sites are often hosted on servers that are located overseas presents some investigative challenges, but they're challenges that we're working very closely with our foreign partners to overcome. The fact that uh, a person commits this kind of crime from what he thinks is the privacy of, a, of an apartment or an office somewhere in Eastern Europe, for example, or Asia, um, is not the safe haven that, uh, that, that it used to be. We are working very hard with our foreign partners not only to um, aggressively um, enforce criminal laws and to take down these the organizations and individuals engaging in this conduct, but we're also working to increase their capacity so that we can reduce the number of safe haven countries throughout the world for people who engage in this kind of behavior. And uh, criminals who, who, particularly criminal organizations that engage in this type of online piracy, for, particularly from overseas or using overseas servers and other assets, should make no mistake about our resolve to find them and locate them and our increasing capacity to do that. Thank you. Uh, my time is up, so I'd like to go to our most distinguished ranking member, Mr. Bilbrey, for five minutes. Of Madam Chair, and I apologize for my tardiness. Gentlemen, right. Mr. Stoll, you said that the American people, you didn't think the American system had the stomach to do the three strikes um, like the British and the French. Um, first of all, it kind of gets me nervous when we figure we don't have the intestinal fortitude of the French, but that's a different issue. Uh, you want to elaborate on why we don't have the stomach for it? I'm not sure. I didn't. Maybe I shouldn't have said don't have the stomach. I don't think that the, that would be the direction we would go because their access for informational purposes would be removed completely as well. So we've got a, a balancing act of interests here. I think there are many mechanisms where we are able to take care of the problem related to piracy, but I'm not sure that that it would probably be in in the interests of our society to block access for other purposes of uh, information exchange, um, education of internet uh, um, access. So I think that that's what I'm trying to say. I think that there are mechanisms that are in place. I, I, we work with MPAA, with RIAA. Um, we are, there are many different things to do. I'm not sure just absolutely black, blocking assets uh, access would be something that we would want to do. Now, I apologize. I'm not as well versed as obviously I should be. When you say blocking assets, are they talking about a national ban? Yeah, that's the British what my talking understanding about a national is. Ban? I, I, I believe that is correct. Okay. You know, gentlemen, let me be a, a little blunt. I think the perception out there, and I'd ask you to either verify it or refute it, is that the when it comes to intellectual pir uh, piracy, uh, China is the Somalia of, of the intellectual world. Is that fair to say? 
If I could just make a couple of comments on that, Ranking Member Bill Bray. Certainly, China has some unique features that make it a special problem. One, uh, it is an enormous exporter. It has the capability to export a wide range of goods and services, many of which have some level of intellectual property. Second, China is also a major market, has become an increasingly large market, not just for U.S. goods, but for goods from other places around the world. And so this is one of the few places around the world where you have both this enormous export capacity as well as a large internal mar market. So U.S. firms are understandably interested in serving that market as well as gaining protection from the kinds of exports that China does produce, both shipping here as well as to third countries. So what you're telling me is China is at that critical location right along the major shipping lanes of intellectual property, which indicates that sounds a lot like Somalia to me. They certainly have a unique position, whether it's in the South, the manufacturing uh, center of the world, where they're able to produce in mass quantities and at relatively high quality, and using intellectual property in some cases that is not uh, owned by those firms. So it does have a unique position. Are you a diplomat? Sure sound like it. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm not a diplomat either, but uh, I've never been accused of being a diplomat. But I, I, I do think it's, it's worth pointing out, uh, Congressman, that that uh, sometimes some of the countries that present the greatest challenges for IP uh, crimes generally um, also are uh, the most engaged in terms of trying to address the, their weaknesses. So it's, it's certainly no, um, there really is no secret and there can't be any dispute that China is a source of a very large quantity of infringing goods, both hard goods and electronic goods. But um, we've enjoyed a, a very productive and, and increasingly uh, so working relationship with Chinese law enforcement. And I think the FBI and ICE and, and Chinese law enforcement officials working with our prosecutors have made great strides over the last few years. Um, so at least from a law enforcement perspective, um, I think China is working hard to, um, uh, to try to address the challenges that even it identifies within its borders. Um, the, uh, one of the areas in which I think we have been effective in other parts of Asia, um, particularly in Southeast Asia and in Eastern Europe, um, through the IPLEC program that I mentioned, we've got a prosecutor who works on a day-to-day -day basis not only to do joint operations with law enforcement in those countries or those regions where we've got IP problems, but also to build their capacity to investigate and prosecute their own cases. And um, we, uh, that's a program that we very much would like to see expanded, or, and, and it's our long-term goal to expand, and China would be probably first on the list of, of places on, on the globe where we think um, uh, more engagement, at least on a law enforcement level, would be productive for everyone. China probably has the best capabilities of doing enforcement of anybody in the world. Um, the, I mean, they probably have one of the tightest knit um, enforcement capabilities that anybody's ever seen on the face of the earth. So their argument for not being able to crack down um, really is, is, is not to remain to this issue. Um, question is I got, though, is with at least the huge reputation of being the pirating capital, doesn't that give indications to other countries um, that, look, if you're big enough, if you're rich enough, if you intimidate the rest of the world, you can get away with a lot of this, or maybe it's the other way that, look, look what's going on in China, why don't we try it in, in uh, Monterey, Mexico, or why don't we try it, try it in um, Singapore? Uh, oh, Singapore is kind of a tight little community, so that you might have that problem too. But questions about how that gives a potential for other parts of the country to expand, I mean, other parts of the world to expand into the, the pirating aspect. I could speak to that, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, if I could. The, uh, I think it's important to bear in mind that China, in addition to being the world's leading exporter of knockoff products, is also really suffering in terms of its domestic market the consequences uh, of really decimating markets for software, music, films, and other IP-intensive products because of in inadequate respect for IPR. So there's a lesson there to other trading partners as well not to go down this path. And we have seen in the Asia-Pacific region and around the world other trading partners uh, such as uh, the Republic of Korea, such as Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, take a different path and really look towards growing respect for IP rights as an important part of their economic growth story. And we would hope that other trading partners around the world follow that example. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd be very interested to know how they handle Windows 7, which is really a blatant uh, piracy action that was going on in China. Thank uh, you. We'll 
now proceed uh, with questioning Mr. Coyer of Texas. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Weinstein, let, let me ask you, what, what are we doing to, uh, let me start off with the Republic of Mexico, a big NAFTA um, uh, country along with Canada. What are we doing to work with them internationally? Because I saw your report where you talk about domestically and the coordination that we have here, but what are we doing to work with, uh, let's say, with the Republic of Mexico? Because now, um, as you know, our drug cartels are now involved, the ones in Mexico are involved in, um, um, you know, they, they're going into legitimate uh, areas now, what we call legitimate businesses. Uh, so I just want to see what uh, we're doing to work with the uh, Mexican government. Uh, Congressman, one of the things that we've been doing recently with Mexico is working with their officials at the border. Uh, one of the things that we do generally when we engage internationally, bilaterally that is, um, is try to identify what the particular weakness is in the enforcement regime of particular countries. And it does vary by region and it certainly varies by country. Sometimes um, the problem is a lack of political will. Um, sometimes the, the problem is the political will is there but the, there's corruption. Sometimes it's a lack of co coordination among agencies that would be uh, responsible for various aspects of IP enforcement. And sometimes it's some combination of the three. In Mexico, at least on the ports, in the ports, um, what we identified as a, a significant weakness was a lack of coordination among agencies that would be responsible for port security. And so one of the things that we did was work aggressively at three of the largest ports in Mexico, including Monterey and Veracruz, um, to improve the level of, of coordination to teach uh, the inspectors and the other people responsible for the security of the port how to do targeted inspections, how to identify potentially infringing goods. And at, at least two of the ports, if I recall correctly, there had never been, or at least one of them, if not two, there had never been an, uh, a seizure of infringing goods prior to our training and our engagement with them. And in the, in the period following that, the technical assistance we provided, um, the, there were seizures uh, through the roof at those ports, and, and, and those ports became much more effective at trying to identify infringing goods as they're moving uh, across the border. So that's one, one area in which we've engaged with Mexico. It's not the only one, but it's one of the most prominent recently. Okay. Uh, it, it, when working with our domestic um, partners, the different law enforcement, uh, I, I know that I've heard from the uh, U.S. Chamber uh, other folks saying that, you know, we got so many threats to our country that when it comes to counterfeiting and, and this type of um, piracy that uh, our resources are not put uh, there, is there anything else we can do to help our businesses to, to protect them from this economic loss and whoever else wants to add to that? Well, I'll jump in, I'll lead off briefly and then, and then turn it over to my colleagues. Um, one, one of the things that we have done um, with our partners at FBI and ICE to try to improve the level of coordination um, and to improve our ability to be responsive to, to IP stakeholders is to invest a lot of time and, and resources in the IP coordination, uh, the IP Rights Coordination Center, which is located in Crystal City. It's, uh, it's operated principally by ICE, but it has partnership from a number of different agencies, uh, FBI and other law enforcement agencies that have um, some interest in, in IP enforcement. Um, and it is intended to do a number of things. Number one, it, it provides for a pooling of intelligence from all these different agencies so that um, they can share intelligence and share information and, and make their investigations uh, more coordinated and more effective. It's also a deconfliction center, and it's also meant to be one-stop shopping for industry. Uh, for, uh, you know, we, we had an industry meeting there on, on Monday, a, a lunch uh, with um, a number, representatives of 29 different uh, IP stakeholder uh, companies or organizations, and one of the things we emphasize to them is that not only can they uh, make referrals directly to the Justice Department, but they can make referrals to the IP Rights Coordination Center. Um, it is meant to be a, a, a place where they can, they can share information themselves, they can make referrals, and, and they can get law enforcement to respond as quickly as possible. Yeah. And I appreciate that. I think that one-stop center so they know who to call instead of you know, being bounced from one place to the other place. So I appreciate that. I appreciate the work that y'all do. Mr. Yeager? Yes, Congressman Clare. One, one point I'd like to make. I think your, your question raises a very important issue, and that is uh, in some cases what, what we find is that these are criminal networks that are operating, for example, along the border. So they may not just be involved in intellectual property crimes. There could also be money laundering. There could be illegal arms sales. Uh, there could be illegal drugs that are being traded by the same criminal network. So I think it is important to focus not just on China, but also look, for example, at the southern border to determine whether products are being brought in by those same criminal networks that are also taking advantage of the, the border to make other uh, transactions, either guns moving south or uh, illegal drugs moving north. Right, right. And, and I, yeah, and again, 
from what we hear, you know, I live in, in Laredo, uh, my border town, and um, we hear that those uh, criminal organizations are starting to look at different ways of making money. Uh, so, you know, appreciate it. So whatever you all can do to protect it. Uh, last question for Mr. McCoy. Uh, Mr. McCoy, just uh, our, our Ambassador Ron Kirk, uh, and I'll close up with this. Uh, are we doing everything possible? I'm a big supporter. I was a big supporter of CAFTA, big supporter of the Colombia, big supporter of Panama, uh, South Korea, and hopefully we'll have those agreements this coming year. But uh, are we doing everything possible under those uh, negotiations to make sure that we uh, protect the uh, intellectual property rights of our stakeholders? I believe we are, Congressman. Ambassador Kirk has uh, said repeatedly that ensuring strong IP protection is one of the top priorities for the President's trade agenda. Uh, it's something that we're working to move forward, uh, both through the implementation of free trade agreements that are already out there, close monitoring and enforcement uh, to make sure that those agreements are properly implemented, our trading partners deliver on their promises. Going forward, as we look toward new trade agreements, as we look to uh, getting the trade agreements that are out there uh, into force. We will continue that emphasis on proper implementation of IP provisions and with efforts like the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement and the special 301 report, we can continue to drive home that point. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Chu, California. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, this is for uh, any of the panelists. Um, the GAO, GAO has identified continued weakness in uh, global intellectual property rights protections and enforcement mechanisms, and uh, specifically cites one challenge being the ineffective coordination of agency stakeholders charged with protection and enforcement responsibilities. From what I understand, there are eight agencies with overlapping protection and enforcement responsibilities. and from what I can tell, there is not one single agency that leads the charge. I know that there was legislation that created the Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator, uh, and uh, this is one step forward, uh, but that, that person has not yet been, um, been uh, put into place at, as of uh, now. What specific steps would you like to see the coordinator take in tackling these issues? Yes, Ms. Chu, oh, I can You want to turn your mic on? Yes, it's on. Uh, bring it real close. You bring it closer to you. Thank you. Uh, I think there are three points that we would make. We think that the, the legislation does address some of the prior weaknesses. I think a couple things that, uh, that we would recommend is that the that the new group follows the guidance in the regarding the key elements of a national strategy so that the IP coordinator can create that strategy and ensure that all all parts are working together. That would include not just the law enforcement, but also the policy level working together. Uh, the balance would also include working both at the firm level as well as at the industry and at the country level. Uh, and finally, I think a point that was made earlier, to the extent possible, utilize alliances with IP owners abroad, because in many cases, uh, the leverage that the United States has can be limited, but when you also team up with some of the IP owners abroad, there could be greater success. So I think there's a couple of general points that we make in our prior statements about how this person and this new group can be effective. Let me add from the uh, perspective of USTR, Congresswoman, that uh, I know that uh, as of yesterday, Victoria Espinel, the IP enforcement coordinator, has just, uh, just started work. Uh, I know she was burning the midnight oil last night on her first day at work because she, uh, 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 she talked with me a little bit about how we can work together. So at USTR, we're looking very much forward to teaming with her. We already work intensively with the other agencies here through interagency coordination of trade policy under the rubric of the Trade Policy Staff Committee mechanism that's been set out by Congress as a vehicle to coordinate, including on uh, intellectual property trade policy. So uh, we work very closely with the other agencies of the U.S. government, and we're looking forward to further enhancing that cooperative relationship under the guidance of the IP Enforcement Coordinator. Very good. Then, uh, Mr. Weinstein, the World Health Organization estimates that 50 percent of drugs worldwide are counterfeit, which translates into approximately $38 billion in loss of legitimate U.S. corporate sales each year 
due to the sale of these counterfeit drugs. This statistic raises great concerns for me because these are life-threatening type of issues and there are huge ramifications to consumers who unknowingly purchase these counterfeit drugs and put themselves at risk. Um, what uh, methods are the Department of Justice implementing to address this problem? Congresswoman, uh, it, it's a great concern to us as well, and one of the ways in which we have tried to use our limited resources, prosecutorial resources, is to focus on um, intellectual property violations that are threats to public health and safety, and I can't think of one more serious than the one you just mentioned. Um, we've ha prosecuted a number of cases going back several years now and, and continuing through uh, the present um, involving people who have uh, produced counterfeit drugs of all types. Cancer drugs is the one, the case I mentioned in my in my uh, oral statement. There are a number of others involving Viagra and, and other types of uh, medications that are mentioned in my written testimony. Um, and what's striking about these cases is that, is that the uh, the, the uh, they are international in scope, just as the online piracy cases are. Um, in fact, uh, in November of last year, uh, a citizen of the Republic of the Philippines was charged here uh, and was convicted and sentenced. Um, for participating in a conspiracy to import Viagra and Cialis and I believe other types of medication as well and was the first person, he was extradited from Thailand, he's the first person ever extradited to the United States on a counterfeit pharmaceutical charge. Um, we hope he will not be the last. Um, so in, in that area as well as the online piracy area we were talking about earlier, we're not stopping at the borders and we're, we're trying to find people who engage in this conduct wherever they are, whether they're in China uh, or here. And um, speaking of China, one of the, the uh, biggest cases involving counterfeit products, it's not a pharmaceutical, but it's a counterfeit product that affects health and safety, involved um, a national of Guinea and a, a U.S. citizen in the Bronx who were conspiring with, to uh, import tubes, counterfeit tubes of toothpaste from China that uh, not only didn't contain uh, fluoride, but also contain microorganisms and in some cases contain diethylene glycol, which is a, an ingredient in hydraulic and brake fluid. Um, and the, uh, the co-conspirators brought in almost 83,000 tubes of this toothpaste, which had a retail value of just under $117,000. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, we managed to, um, uh, to get the importers here in the United States, and, and they got significant sentences. So um, this is an area that continues to be of concern to us, I would say, other than online piracy um, uh, and, uh, and counterfeiting that involves online auction sites and, and direct sales sites, that public health and safety continues to be the area where we try to, to put our greatest emphasis. Thank you. I see my time is up. Thank you. And we'll now proceed to Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, let me pick up, if I may, where Ms. Chu left off, um, Mr. Weinstein. Uh, we acknowledge that uh, not only human pharmacological agents, but veterinarian pharmacological agents are a problem as well coming into the United States. Uh, I know the Department of Justice was involved for many years in trying to prosecute folks who were willfully violating our laws and introducing pirated uh, antibiotics and other substances to force growth uh, into our livestock. Uh, and feed chain here in the United States. Uh, there, are, there are just lots of examples, intellectual property examples involving software, involving music and movies and, uh, and all the technologies associated with them over the years. Uh, the, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, you could go to Itaewon and Seoul or you could go to neighborhoods in Taipei or Hong Kong and blatantly get knockoffs or uh, uh, infringed items um, at a discount. Um, if you look at, if, if enforcement is everything it should be, and the estimate is accurate that we're losing about a quarter of a billion dollars a year because of intellectual property infringements of one sort or another, the best estimate I've, I've seen in terms of uh, uh, border agent seizures of uh, pirated materials is a, it, the, the value is something south of 300 million. In other words, about 1% of the estimated cost of the total infringements. Doesn't that suggest that, while well, you're not expecting everything to come through our borders, but 1% sounds pretty low in terms of our success rate at interdicting these uh, materials uh, or agents coming into our, our country? Congressman, um, I, I can't, um, I, I wasn't smart enough to check your math, and I can't, I, I don't have, um, figures myself on the on the amount of infringing goods, hard goods, that is, that are seized at the border. But I, I will say as a general matter, whether you're talking about goods coming in across borders or you're coming, uh, talking about goods that are coming here electronically, um, the problem is far greater than the resources law enforcement has available, either investigative or prosecutive resources. And 
Um, and I think the problem grows as more and more piracy is committed through online means. Um, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, but I'm also particularly optimistic because I think the people who we have conducting these investigations, leading these prosecutions are, uh, are the best trained in the world and uh, work very hard to stay at, to keep pace with and, and indeed to be one step ahead of the people that we're investigating. Um, and so I think that we've got terrific people doing it, we just don't have enough of them, and the problem is of a magnitude that is far greater than our resources allow. Having said that, I think that one of the, the things that that demonstrates is the need for us to be able to, to turn ourselves into force multipliers, and, to, and that is to expand capacity overseas so that our overseas partners can engage in aggressive enforcement actions within their own borders. And I'll give you just one example that I think is fairly illustrative. Um, the IPLEC that I mentioned in Eastern Europe, um, you're going to begin to think I'm getting paid by every time I mention IPLEX. But it, our IPLEX in Eastern Europe um, worked with law enforcement in the Ukraine, which was trying to take down a, a major piracy site that was operating in the Ukraine. Um, and they didn't know how to conduct an investigation of that type. And the IPLEX worked with them. And their technology was quite outdated. They had an outdated personal computer, um, and they had a dial-up internet connection. Um, and using an outdated personal computer with a dial-up internet connection, uh, internet connection, following the guidance given to them by the one prosecutor we have over there, an investigator in Ukraine took down the entire site. Um, and so by engaging in trainings like that and in teaching people overseas how to make these cases themselves, not only do we, we have bigger, splashier, more high-impact law enforcement operations here, um, but we can, we can uh, uh, multiply the number of, of people who are able to be prosecuted um, in, the, in the countries in which right. they're operating. Uh, thank you, and that's helpful. Uh, you know, uh, with respect to enforcement, there are sort of two broad aspects to this. One has to do with capability in the ground, ours and our counterparts. The other has to do, though, with political will. And, and I'd, I'd like the panel to address that. Um, candidly, we know that in some cases, including trading partners and allies of the United States, are not seized with this mission. Um, how how uh, severe are we prepared to be, and historically, how severe have we ever been in impressing upon an ally or a trading partner or even somebody who's neither of those categories that we mean business and we're prepared to exact a price if they don't, in fact, change their behavior from the top. Uh, I can speak to that, Congressman. I think that we need to have a strategy that proceeds on two fronts. Uh, one is to be very frank and, when appropriate, very critical of our trading partners who don't step up to the challenge. And the other front is to work in tandem with our trading partners through leadership and partnership to really get at this problem better. Because uh, on the one hand, we have to be honest enough to call it out when the problem is bad. On the other hand, we cannot solve this global problem alone. We have to have international leadership and partnership and be working with our trading partners. And sometimes we have to be capable of walking and chewing gum, of doing both of those things at the same time with the same trading partners. Uh, there have certainly been occasions in the past when uh, we have gone all the way to the extent of trade sanctions uh, with trading partners who refuse to protect U.S. intellectual property. The most recent occasion was Ukraine. Uh, all of the tools uh, of the trade arsenal are available to make progress where it's appropriate, uh, and we're uh, continuing to use all the tools at our disposal. Madam Chair, when my time is up, um, and by the way, I'd ask for unanimous consent that my opening statement be entered into the record. Without objection. And, and I just want to observe before you call on Mr. Murphy that um, I thank Mr. McQuick for his answer. Inferentially, one could conclude from your answer uh, some criticism of past performance on our part in terms of our consistency in strict enforcement and so conveying to other countries in the international community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Murphy from Connecticut. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, I, I want to continue to pursue the line of questioning from Mr. Connolly and other members of uh, the committee uh, regarding our current approach to, I guess, supply side enforcement when it comes to um, pirated content on the internet. And I was a little discouraged to hear um, your critique of 
demand side restrictions because I, I wonder about the efficacy of a strategy that effectively tries to play whack-a-mole around the world. We're talking about one guy with a computer that can move his computer, can move his location, can move the site of his, uh, of, of his uh, hosting entity from city to city, from country to country. Uh, and I guess I don't doubt your resolve, but as we look at the trend line over the last several years, um, the amount of pirated content and the uh, um, number of sites that are selling them are going in only one direction. Uh, and, and so uh, I guess I ask this. Um, what what tools do you need that you don't have now uh, to try to pursue this supply side uh, enforcement policy? And how worried should I or any of us be about the ability of the people who are perpetuating these sites to just simply move to a different place or to um, uh, or to take up residence under a different business entity? Uh, given the fact that it is so easy uh, to just put up a new site and take one down the minute that they sniff that law enforcement is onto them. First, uh, Congressman, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not suggesting that, that enforcement should only be supplies that are demand side. I think that given limited federal resources, um, we can have the greatest impact by pursuing the supply side, by getting the people who are exactly doing exactly what you just described, who are actually the first providers of the online content that is then downloaded by people throughout the world. You can get the person who is downloading it uh, and making a, a few infringing copies, but you haven't actually made an impact unless you take down the person who is obtaining it, putting it online, and making it available. Um, to, your, to your question, uh, what do we need? Um, I, I would say that um, the greatest investment of resources that we have made um, is in this IPLEC program, because with the cost of putting one prosecutor in a foreign region or foreign country, um, that person can have an impact on enforcement operations. Um, both transnational enforcement operations and, and uh, enforcement operations in the countries and regions in which he's operating um, that, that go far beyond what that one prosecutor could, prosecutor could do working on a, even a very full caseload here in the United States. So it's, it's, a, it's not an inexpensive program by any means, the cost of putting a person and his family overseas for an extended but We view it as a sound investment in, um, in our ability to, to have a greater impact on the enforcement side, not only here but throughout the world. Um, in terms of how concerned you'd be that someone has the capacity to basically pick up and move their operations, I would say there is reason to be concerned about it, but, uh, but by no means are those um, methods of evading detection or evading capture uh, foolproof, in fact, quite the contrary. Um, as we have Im improved our relationships with our foreign partners, as we have uh, increased our ability to share evidence and to share intelligence and to share information um, qu more quickly than we ever have before, um, the person who picks up his server and moves it uh, overseas or moves it from one country to another country overseas um, is much more vulnerable than, than he ever has been before. Um, and, and that's why, um, you know, Attorney General Holder, um, I, I said that this was a high priority for him. It was a, uh, Attorney General Holder actually initiated the department's first major IP initiative when he was the Deputy Attorney General back in 1999. And one of the, the principles of that initiative that we continue to build on today um, is the need to engage with our foreign partners so that we can not only um, uh, have effective law enforcement against people who are operating in their countries, but so that they can be more effective in their own countries. So I, I think that we, um, our, our determination to get people wherever they are and to, and to find their servers and to find uh, their assets wherever they are in the world has never been greater, and our capacity to do it has never been greater. So then let me ask this, how do I square that? with data showing that the amount of pirated content is greater than ever. So how do I square your enforcement capacity being greater than ever with the, um, with the amount of pirated content continuing to grow? I, I, unfortunately, I don't think that they're, they're in, inconsistent at all. I think, the, as, I, as I mentioned to Congressman Conley, I think the problem is of a magnitude that is far greater than the resources that, that are currently available to address it. So we try to address it as, qui as, as intelligently and strategically as we can, both in terms of identifying what targets we should pursue in our own enforcement operations and, as I said, in, in terms of um, trying to improve the ability of our international partners. But, but it's, it's largely a resource problem. I think the strategies we have are effective. I think the people we have doing it are outstanding. But um, there, are, there are not enough of them. So I think it's a resource issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, and now we will call on our distinguished member from California, Ms. Jackie Spears. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I guess this is a question for Mr. Weinstein. 
there's an alarming number of reported instances where information technology goods are counterfeited abroad to sell here in America. Can you speak in general terms of those nations that pose the greatest threat to our information technology vendor supply chain for counterfeiting and national security matters? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I think um, I, I don't think I can speak even in, in the most general terms to the countries that pose the greatest threat from a national security point of view, but I'd be happy to discuss that with the folks in our national security division and get back to you with a, a more detailed answer um, after the, the hearing. What I can say is that, that um, the regions that are the greatest um, concern to us right now, um, I think are China, obviously, as we discussed earlier, um, South, uh, South America, and parts of Africa. Um, and we have tried to, um, to devote resources in terms of training and technical assistance to law enforcement in South Africa, for example, in Brazil, in India, um, and in, in other parts of Southeast Asia, um, and, and, and again in China, um, to try to address that as, as proactively as we can. But I, I think that if um, the regions that we are the most concerned about in terms of not just online piracy, but all types of piracy would be would be South America and, and, uh, and Africa and, and China. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I think um, uh, those areas that present the greatest challenge are often also present the greatest opportunity. And, and some of the, the law enforcement uh, officials in those countries uh, tend to be the ones who are the most um, fully engaged with us um, and are just as aware as we are of the, of the extent to which the problem um, flows through or arises from the region that they're operating in. So the fact that there's a great deal of piracy that, that involves those countries is not in any way indictment of the law enforcement officials in those countries' commitment to address it. Um, in fact, it, it, oftentimes, as I said, those, those tend to be our most committed partners. All right. Uh, Mr. Yeager, in, thank you for your work on the GAO reports and I guess the ones that predated it that created the genesis of uh, the new legislation. The one area that you keep coming back to is the area of just human capital and not necessarily committing enough human capital planning. And I, I guess you're speaking of uh, the operations abroad. Uh, could you elaborate on that some more and, and tell us, if you haven't already, um, what more we need to do? GAO has done a number of reports, as you know, on human capital planning. We've done some for the State Department uh, more generally. We've done some for USAID. But in, in this context, I think one of the things that we learned when we traveled uh, last summer to visit some of the, the key locations where intellectual property uh, crimes are, are rampant is that having someone in that post who was full-time on that job, full-time on IP, someone who understood some of the technical issues related to intellectual property protection, even understanding some of the laws in those host countries, and and having the ability to, to understand the culture. We, we thought that those three particular assets were extremely important. And where you had that combination, we found uh, in our discussions with the private sector that the private sector felt very well served and they felt that the, uh, the U.S. officials could be very helpful to them in making contact, solving problems in some cases before they became a serious problem, and in some cases solving problems after uh, it got to the point where they needed to, to address it with, uh, you know, with the host government. So uh, we, we certainly found great support for some of the kinds of people that were put abroad uh, recently by the Patent and Trademark Office. But I think one of the other points that we make, and I, I make this in my written statement, is that you need the ability to continue to send that set of people with those skills over there. And agencies that haven't long had a foreign presence may not be that deep in terms of having people with the cultural expertise as well as the technical expertise. So that's one of the cautions that we made in the report that we recently released. So you looked at four different countries. That's, we went to three countries, four posts. Uh, China, because of the importance of the Guangzhou area, has, a, has an IP attache in that consulate because it's such a, a large producer of, of goods for the world. So where else do we need to have individuals outposted uh, that we don't I presently? Think it, of course, it depends on the, the size of the program. We know that in some... Some places in Central Europe are a significant problem. We know that South America has some, uh, I think what USTR calls notorious trading areas. Uh, there are certainly other places in Southeast Asia where you could uh, probably benefit from having additional personnel. But again, if the personnel don't have that unusual combination of expertise, uh, they will not be as effective as the people that were first put in those posts. 
But it would seem to me, there should, I see my time has expired, that this should be a high priority for us if we're really going to address this issue long term. So it might be behoove us to identify those other countries and make sure that there are individuals with those skills outposted. If you could provide that to us in the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank this panel for your testimony. And uh, now you will be excused so we can bring up the second panel. Thank you so very, very much. No jokes today.